Good morning. So I, my, I'd like to welcome you back to the second panel of today's discussion on Iraq and Syria. My name is Michael Yaffe. I'm the Vice President for the Middle East and Africa programs here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. As Nancy Linsborg uh, opened the session this morning, she mentioned that we are at a pivotal point with regard to the future of Iraq and Syria. And so this whole day is devoted to answering questions, what is that going to look like? And in this morning's program, we, the first panel, focused on what is going on inside Iraq directly. But it didn't take very long for questions to ask, were asked about what happens with the neighbors and the neighbors' impact into Iraq. So this panel opens up that aperture a bit more, and it will directly ask the questions about Iraq and Syria and the neighborhood. So to lead the discussion, I'm glad to introduce uh, Devin Barron, who is the executive managing the executive editor, excuse me, of Defense One, and uh, Devin will uh, open with uh, and introduce the panelists. So, please. Thank you, thank you, and thanks to USAIP for putting together a great day uh, of what I expect will be very newsmaking, especially in this next panel coming up. Um, it's 11.30, we have a hard stop at 12.30 uh, for lunch, I'm instructed to let everyone know. Um, so we'll do some talking and save some space for some questions at the end. Um, but we do have a, a, a great panel, a timely panel, to talk about the region. So we have uh, someone who's, we have experts on Turkey, on Iran, on Russia, on the internal groups in Iraq, uh, so we can get to all of it. Uh, so I'm Kevin Barron, I'm the executive editor of Defense One, and if you don't know us, we are the national security brand of Atlantic Media, so we're a sister to the Atlantic. Uh, I'm a Pentagon reporter for the last 10 years, so my perspective comes straight from the military coverage of this region. Uh, I just went to Iraq last, and, and Syria, with General Votel and USAID Director Mark Green, or Administrator Mark Green, um, in January. We went up to Raqqa, um, we spent a day in Baghdad, and uh, needless to say, uh, I was probably as shocked as I think they might have been to hear the president last week say uh, that very soon the U.S. would be pulling out of Syria and then to be followed by with, with a freeze of, uh, of funds for Syria uh, when just at, the, at this moment, as we heard from the last panel, uh, when the ground war is nearing a, a completion or at least has had, had been getting close to a completion, a lot of people thought, and there was a future to be, to be started and a lot of stability, stability ops or stabilization ops, um, uh, a, a mild low version of reconstruction that required a whole lot of funding. And I stood with uh, General Votel outside of Raqqa when he pounded his fist on the table and said the world needs to do more, uh, that we need more funding uh, for this region to secure the gains that the military had, uh, had helped uh, Syrians, Kurds, Iraqis, Arab, a big coalition win back from ISIS. So that's the setup to the moment we're at. Um, so here we are where, where the president makes his statement and we're all kind of, I think, on edge to see whether or not we should believe him. <laughs> if, this is a, if this was a real policy directive or if it was just an offhand comment. Um, but the money freeze what is, a, what is a real directive. So we have something to talk about today. Uh, and I wanted to open up to our panelists. So to introduce them briefly, next to me I have Dr. Mark Katz from George Mason University, professor, and his, his, his field is Russia. Uh, Mona Yakubian uh, from USIP here, who's uh, focusing on Syria, who has written for us at Defense One also, formerly with USAID. Uh, next to her, Dr. Eli Abouaoun, uh, the director of MENA countries here at USIP. Uh, and at the far end, Ali Nader, uh, of RAND at a part-time function now in consulting, um, who will bring us into the conversation as well. Uh, Mona, I wanted to start with you, um, to, you start generically, but to get your reaction to this moment that room with the president and what it would mean. Um, Syria, you know, let's start with the most important neighbor to Iraq right now, perhaps, at least on the, the ISIS fight mission. Um, what would it mean if this went through, a sudden pullout, and what's been the reaction to the, the freezing of funds? Well, uh, thanks, Kevin, and, and good morning to everyone. I, you know, I think it's really important to understand uh, the, the two events of last week, the president's statement and the freezing of funds, first in the context of where are we right now in Syria. Um, I think Syria is at a dangerous inflection point on the ground, uh, certainly in terms of the counter-ISIS campaign, 
which has stalled somewhat on the ground. Uh, uh, Kurdish partners of the U.S., their attention has been turned uh, to the north and the west, toward Afrin, uh, the, the uh, Kurdish canton that was uh, uh, recently taken over by Turkish forces. Uh, there is a deteriorating security situation in the east. A U.S. A soldier was recently killed in an IED attack. A key uh, interlocutor uh, for uh, forces on the ground who's been working to bridge Arabs and Kurds together on the ground was assassinated not long before that. So we're at a very dangerous moment on the ground in Syria. And at the same time, I think we're at this critical uh, inflection point with respect to US policy. And uh, cl clearly, we're at a key crunch point in terms of which direction the US goes. Um, if, in fact, uh, we do precipitously pull out from Syria, I think that will have a significant impact on our ability to uh, sustain the wins against ISIS thus far and, more importantly, help stabilize. So well, let's talk about that for a second, because the, the, the argument for the, a pullout is, uh, in, you know, in, a, in a very crude and short way, is to avoid another rack, right? It's uh, the U.S., look, we went in, we had to go back in, you had to take care of ISIS and pull out, and frankly, that's what this president was elected for. He went out there on, on the campaign trail, and we were talking backstage, and we said he, that when the president says, we're going to go take care of ISIS and kill those bad guys, he gets huge applause lines. And when he says, we're going to pull out of that region, he also gets huge applause lines. Um, so uh, if that happens, who, is it not a benefit to the U.S.? And if not, who is it a benefit to? Who, so, who are the winners? Yeah, I think the answer to that argument is the reason not to pull out is to avoid another Iraq. And by that, I mean you know, when we, U.S. troops withdrew somewhat precipitously from Anbar and from Iraq in 2011 uh, without really fully having the area stabilized. That set the conditions for the birth of ISIS, in part. And so I think in some ways the lessons learned from Iraq inform us on why it is uh, important to maintain a presence on the ground in Syria. I do think it's important for people to understand, though, this is not a huge footprint. It's a relatively mm -hmm. small footprint, 2,000 or so troops. And it's largely dependent on this model of working by, with, and through partner forces on the ground. So it's not an enormous commitment of resources or manpower, but it's strategically critical. Well, let's, we can take this two ways. We can go, go big to Russia and Turkey, or, but let's stay with the, the Syrians and the Kurds for a little bit. And um, um, Ali, maybe you can talk to the, the different minority groups at stake here, and this is still focusing on Syria, perhaps, but there's been a promise to the Syrians to stick with it. General Votel said in January when we were out there um, that his mission is not just the, to the completion of the territorial win over ISIS, but it's to the end of the Geneva process. And now we're at a moment, there's news today of another meeting to, coming up between the Iranians and the Russians and the Turks, and it's an alternate path to Geneva. Um, what's the response, um, in the, at least in the Kurdish realm, um, out there in the region to this, you know, this discord of what's been happening on the U.S. side? Thank you. Uh, well, I think that uh, as, uh, as an institute of peace, we always uh, try to put on the table the importance of the civilian engagement uh, mm -hmm. that should go hand in hand with any military strategy. Uh, and this applies in both Iraq, Syria, and other places. And from that perspective, I think that uh, engaging uh, uh, diplomatically, economically, and socially in many other aspects uh, with the Kurds and with other groups operating in, uh, I mean, in this case, northeastern Syria, but in, in all parts of Syria, is, is a very important effort that uh, should not be ignored or, or underestimated. And within that broader civilian engagement comes the issue of minority, minorities. Uh, minority groups are uh, part of the origin inhabitants of uh, both Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and other places in the region. And addressing uh, their, the issue of uh, safe and dignified, dignified life of these minority groups is very important for the future stability of the region. It's equally important for the future security and peace framework that would reign in the region uh, later on. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> from this specific angle of how to deal with the minorities, I would put forward 
two important elements that I'll be happy, I'll be happy to elaborate on later on. Uh, one of them is revisit the governance models that should be uh, that should be put in place in these regions, in order to uh, get rid of the obsolete and archaic nation-state model that doesn't apply to the region, obviously. And the second one is to encourage and support the minority groups themselves to revisit some of the paradigms, some of the cultural paradigms that they've been embracing for the last 50, 60 years or even more. Uh, and most importantly, the one that uh, always pull in the West uh, to support the minority groups against other groups in the region. I think this paradigm has to shift a little bit and we need to go to, uh, to go to another, to a different paradigm that uh, is more inclusive and uh, that get rid of the zero, these zero-sum game logic uh, that some minority groups have embraced. So is that more in line with what uh, we heard the Iraqi ambassador say in the last panel, that there are now political parties um, forming based on something other than ethnic blocs? And that they are, he at least, he's, he's claiming that they are uh, more inclusive, they all are, they all are multi-ethnic. Um, not just in their makeup, but in the policies and what they're saying, is that? Well, in, in Iraq, as Ambassador Yassin pointed out, it's, uh, we, we clearly see signs of a shift from the identity-based politics to issues-based politics. Uh, my fear is that this might be easily reversible if this is not sustained by a, oh. by a governance model uh, that needs to be put in place. And this is where I see some reluctance uh, by some groups in Iraq uh, to engage into, into this effort. Okay, so that's, a, that's one data point of how things are different this time around for a post-conflict Iraq to move forward. Um, Mark, I wanted to ask you, uh, so uh, going back into, into Syria and thinking of, of if there was a, a U.S. pullout, especially a quick one, uh, very soon, as the president said, uh, the, very, the very quick take was, well, that helps Russia. Uh, that's probably exactly what they would want, and it's, you know, the, the void of American involvement in Syria is what allowed Russia to get in there in the first place. Uh, what's your perspective on what, that, what this announcement means and what it could mean going forward? Well, certainly I think the, uh, the, the initial reaction would be uh, one of great happiness, but I have a feeling that they're also maybe a little uncomfortable. Uh, I was uh, in Moscow at the end of February at the Valdai Club's uh, Middle East Conference in which uh, uh, Sergei Lavrov uh, addressed us. And what was very clear was that from him and the other sort of Russian speakers was that the American support for the Kurds and Turkish unhappiness with that was seen as an opportunity that uh, for Russia to exploit. In other words, that, that the prospect of deteriorating Turkish-American relations is something that they are very happy about. And I think that one of the, the, the announcement that uh, the U.S. will be withdrawing from Syria, if, if nothing else, this, this removes uh, a degree of tension between uh, Turkey and the United States, or at least perhaps that's how it's, uh, how it's thought of, uh, obviously at, at the expense of the Kurds, but that this is no longer something that, that Moscow will be able to exploit. The other issue, I think, is that um, you know, Russia and Iran, they've been working together, obviously, against uh, several different adversaries, including the United States. But uh, they do have uh, tensions, they have differences in Syria, and certainly a U.S. withdrawal might tend to heighten this. Now, it's not the kind of uh, tension, I think, that they're not each trying to eliminate the other in Syria, but I think that there is a competition for who's going to have the upper hand. And I have a feeling, you know, if, if there's any uh, sort of, you know, cunning behind the decision to withdraw U.S. forces, it's perhaps with the idea that this might promote Russian-Iranian discord. And, and I think it will promote some degree of discord, but I'm not sure it's going to lead to an all-out uh, 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 struggle between them. Right. I mean, in the, a, a pullout wouldn't necessarily mean, you know, everything's handed over to Russia and they, that, it, that it's over. You still have divided Syria. You still have a, con a conflict that needs to, to be solved, to get to a, to mm -hmm. a peace eventually. Mm -hmm. Good point. And in fact, that is, that is the one thing that uh, Russia actually does want the U.S. to play a role, and that is with regard to the reconstruction. Uh, certainly, uh, the Russians, uh, uh, they don't want to have to pay for this, and I'm not sure that they can. 
And, and one of the arguments that they have made, certainly at the previous Valdai Middle East Conference, was that uh, peace and security in Syria is a global public good, therefore the rest of the globe should contribute toward it. And of course, many of the American participants just saw this as a shakedown. But they, they, they want, in other words, they, 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 this is one degree of cooperation with, with the United States that they, they really want, because if the US uh, contributes to this, a lot of other actors will as well. And so they, they seem to honestly think that they can somehow bring this about. And of course, uh, Trump's announcement sort of, I should imagine, would cause further doubt uh, about this. And, uh, and that uh, maybe the Russians might respond, well, not quite so fast. <laughs> Well, I mean, wasn't the, the irony of that is uh, the U.S. are making the same call. I mean, General Votel, again, in, in Raqqa was calling out to the world saying, we need help here, but the world won't come because they don't have permission, they, right? They don't have Assad's permission to do it, and, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it, maybe the Assad would give it to the Russians, but the world won't because they can't. But Ali, jump in with, with us here on your perspective uh, from, you know, on Iran and how they're reacting and what, what the prospects are for them to take advantage of this. Well, good morning, everybody. I think this is great news for the Iranian leadership, for the Iranian regime, uh, because uh, the Islamic Republic has expended so much effort and resources and lives in Syria in order to uh, protect the Assad regime. And this really would contradict uh, President Trump's goal of countering Iran in the Middle East. Uh, President Trump has said that uh, he does not like the JCPOA. He wants to uh, leave the agreement potentially, uh, but also he wants to counter Iran in the region. And uh, this is a key uh, area for Iran to exercise power and uh, expand its influence. Uh, and it comes at a very critical time for the Iranian uh, regime, uh, given that Iran is experiencing really unprecedented uh, internal unrest in December of 2017. Uh, there was a major uprising in Iran. Uh, it's still ongoing. Every day there are reports of demonstrations, civil disobedience in Iran. Uh, just in the past few days, uh, uh, Iran's Khuzestan province, which is uh, uh, inhabited by the minority Arab population, has experienced major protests. Uh, there's been major violence in the city of Ahla. So there's immense pressure on the Iranian regime. Um, uh, but I think if the U.S. withdraws uh, from Syria, uh, then that will uh, release some of the pressure. And one uh, reason uh, for Iranians uh, demonstrating against the regime in the past few months has been this very wide perception in Iran uh, that uh, the regime is spending Iranians' money in places like Syria and Iraq. When Iranians went into the streets in December, uh, that was one of the major slogans, uh, b basically expressing uh, why the regime was spending their money in these countries. Uh, so I, 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 this really benefits uh, the Iranian regime more than anybody else. And if the U.S. really wants to counter Iran in the region, uh, it has to stay in Syria. Uh, it has to support the Kurdish groups it has been supporting. Uh, Iran is very concerned. Uh, the regime is very concerned about uh, Kurdish independence movements in the region. It played a very key role uh, in putting down the Kurdish uh, attempts to become independent. Uh, General Qasem Soleimani of the Quds Force was the key figure who uh, defeated the Kurdish effort. And uh, the regime is uh, right now looking to do the same in Syria with uh, Turkish and uh, Russian cooperation. Hey Mark, do you want to know? Reactors. Right. Uh, certainly uh, in, in Russia, it's been noticed that these demonstrations in Iran uh, have an anti-Syrian uh, involvement uh, aspect. And this has frightened the Russians. Uh, what, what they're very frightened of is that there'll be some change in Iran that would, that would lead Iran to withdraw from Syria. Because even though they're competing for influence in Syria, in fact, Iran is, is supplying, uh, and its allies, a lot more of the ground forces. Russia's just running the, the air war. And the Russians don't want to be left in, in Syria uh, by themselves. In other words, that they, they piggyback essentially on, on the Iranians. And I think that uh, you, know, you, you point to, I think, something that, that's very important. But 
um, that uh, the, the Trump announcement will benefit the Iranians. On the other hand, it puts real pressure on the Russians because the Russians, they don't just have good relations with Iran. They also have good relations with Saudi Arabia and the GCC and with the Israelis. And we have anecdotal evidence to the, to the su suggesting that what the Russians tell these other audiences is that you don't like Iran and Syria? Well, it's a good thing we're there, isn't it, to, to keep them in check for you. But the, the point is, is that with, with the US withdrawal, then the question comes up, can Russia keep Iran in check? And if it can't, this is gonna have a very negative impact on Israeli-Russian relations, Saudi-Russian relations. And these relationships are very important for Russia. That is, in other words, that if, if the Russians can't keep Iran in check in Syria, then it just shows that Russia is perhaps not the great power that uh, it claims to be. And I think Israel, if I can cut in, um, that's a key point um, that we should really consider because the Israeli government is very concerned uh, about the Iranian regime building military bases on its northern border. And if the US isn't there to keep the balance of power, uh, then I think that increases the chances of a conflict, a military conflict, a major military conflict uh, between Iran and its allies on one hand and Israel on the other. Right, I don't, I don't think there's a question, you know, U.S. Israeli supported, but you know, that's one thing to remember. If the U.S. pulls out of Syria, they're still in a lot of places in the region um, in very robust numbers. But the one country where I'm, we're not hearing much of yet, to me, is Turkey. And the crossroads of Syria's future right now go through Erdogan's office in a lot of ways. Uh, Mona, uh, you know, talk to us about, a little bit about, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure where, where to start on this, but how, how come the United States can't get Turkey to stop? Well, I think, you know, one, one taking a step back, I think in some ways um, we are perhaps at the most dangerous and perilous moment thus far in Syria's seven-year conflict, precisely because of some of what we've been talking about, the, the danger of Israeli-Iranian confrontation, but more urgently, the looming confrontation with Turkey. Uh, and I think President Erdogan has been very clear that Turkey will not tolerate a Kurdish entity uh, in northern Syria on its border. From the Turkish perspective, that is the true existential threat, more so even than ISIS. And so that's in part what prompted Turkey to uh, invade and now take control over Afrin. Uh, and President Erdogan has been very, very clear that if Kurdish forces aren't pushed out of Menbij, uh, that they will move on Menbij. This is setting up truly a, a confrontation potentially between two NATO allies, the US and Turkey. Uh, you have Iran uh, and the Syrian regime and Russia also not, not far. I mean, this is a, a flashpoint that has both regional and global reverberations. And not clear in this moment of great uncertainty about US policy and our posture in Syria, not clear how exactly we are going to deal with this very urgent and immediate threat. I mean, Syria, when Afrin started, and that was one crisis to deal with, but the threat to Mambij, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say the only reason they haven't pushed to Mambij is because the U.S. is there. Right. I mean, like you said, that, that's, the, that's the absolute conflict point. So right. Right. assume they get pulled out, then that changes just all of northern Syria. Well, but if it, if it doesn't, was what I want to ask. Yeah. If, so if the pullout doesn't happen, and Trump has talked off the ledge uh, at this you know, me meeting today, or by whomever does it, um, there's a lot of people that do it, it seems like, with the national security, at least. Um, and I don't say that flippantly. I mean, I, Trump, you know, Sec Secretary Mattis has said to us how, you know, one of the, not just Secretary Mattis, other generals have said to me, too, when, when they meet with Trump, you, he, they can talk to him for 30 minutes about something, and he will listen. He will understand the issues. He's not a foreign policy guy. He's not a national security guy, even if he's been president for a year. Um, that was the case with Gitmo. That was the case with NATO when he came into that. And maybe that'll be the case this time around. Um, how, how do you how do you see how do you see a future for, of, of Syria? And we get we need to get to Iraq, but this all comes around. How do you see the future of Syria playing out to getting to Geneva, and if not Geneva, to what else? How can this possibly end in a way that is peaceful, that key, that and that placates all the concerns you said of Turkey has, all the desires the U.S. has for the region, all the desires for Russia, all the desires for Iran, uh, and probably all the desires of Assad himself. Well, I think that's an impossibly tall order, to be quite honest. <laughs> and I wouldn't profess to tell you how that happens. Uh, if anyone does know, um, you know, there, there's clearly a job waiting for them. But I think um, 
Look, I think there's a real issue that, that we do have to contend with front and center, which is tensions with Turkey and how to deal with this inherent contradiction in our policy that began when we made the decision to rely on uh, Kurdish forces, who have been the most effective and reliable partner on the ground in Syria to fight ISIS. Now that inherent contradiction is really coming into full, uh, full focus. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, the US needs to, in many ways, perhaps step up its diplomatic game and get more creative on, on how to find a way to thread that needle between satisfying and understanding Turkish concerns. And in particular, Turkey has noted that it was promised that when the Kurds came into Menbij to clear ISIS, they would retreat back east of the Euphrates River once that was done, and they have not. So they, that is raised repeatedly. Um, at the same time, we've relied heavily on our Kurdish partners on the ground, and there's, there's some real importance to also fulfilling or playing a role in ensuring uh, that their, their aspirations to some degree are, are also fulfilled, and what does that look like? And so I think the US really needs to, to um, think about how to navigate those tensions and find some creative solutions that begin to satisfy Turkey. Uh, maybe it has to do with greater diplomacy or trying to rejuvenate uh, the peace process that ended in Turkey in 2015 between the Turks and the PKK. Right. Um, and finding some modus vivendi uh, in, in Menbij that, that, allows, uh, that doesn't allow the entire counter ISIS mission to unravel, which it, which it quite well could. If, if this isn't resolved. I mean, it's almost a question for the, I mean, the next panel, you know, Mark Green, General Votel, Brett McGurk, those are the senior guys in charge of this region right now. Is that not accurate to say? I mean, it, uh, until Mike Pompeo comes into state, and by all, me, by all assumptions, he, gets, he sails through confirmation, uh, John Bolton has now just, just gotten to the White House. Um, but, you know, even if this is, you know, add this to all the other global crises in the world, but, but does it need a, um, some sort of higher, would it help to have higher level uh, leadership from the United States uh, in, into any direction, or is it just too complicated? Well, I think it's, it's, we do need to develop a coherent strategy for Syria that lays out what our key priorities are and how we, we aim to fulfill them. It, it has been driven by the counter ISIS prerogative. That's been priority number one, yeah. both under President Obama. But that's narrow. That's, that's the simple mission. Well, it's not so narrow, though. I think it's, it's actually quite complicated. I mean, I think it's very, I think that's what we're learning, and that's where some of the alarm bells are going off, that it's not merely about um, uh, liberating territory from ISIS. It's also about stabilizing that territory and ensuring or beginning to address the underlying grievances that gave rise to the, to the group in the first place. So how do we do that? and also play a leading role in terms of the diplomacy and bringing some sort of political settlement to Syria uh, and ensuring that, that the neighbors are, are all engaged as well in, in that overall overarching solution. So let's turn it uh, now onto Iraq. And um, Ali, uh, you know, how, how has, well, you, mean, you mentioned Iran earlier, um, and it made me recall that, um, and this came up a little bit in the last session, but. I think the, the simple line on Iran and, and uh, with the inside Iraq still is that Iran is a meddling influence and the US is worried about it. Give us a little bit of myth versus reality right now of how much the, uh, Iran is a meddling influence in Iran versus, I mean, in Iraq um, to an, versus mm, to an acceptable level, no, these are neighbors working together versus how the United States has got to swallow that pill and deal with it. I, I don't think even uh, meddling describes what uh, the Iran regime is doing in Iraq. Uh, it's a key player in that country. Uh, when we look at what Iran is doing, it has uh, established an infrastructure uh, for long-term influence in Iraq. Uh, the, way, the same way it has done in other places uh, by supporting Hezbollah in Lebanon, for example, uh, and training uh, numerous militias uh, in Syria. Um, there are an estimated uh, 50 to 100,000 Iraqi militiamen uh, that are one way or another under the influence of Tehran, um, the popular mobilization uh, units uh, that were trained um, largely by Iran to counter ISIS uh, are still playing a very influential uh, role in Iraq security. 
they've been officially integrated into mm -hmm. uh, the Iraqi security and armed forces. Uh, they're receiving a budget uh, from Baghdad and getting funding from Iran at the same time. Uh, uh, when we look at Qasem Soleimani's activities, uh, he has very close ties uh, to leaders of several of these militia groups uh, that have become very prominent in Iraq. And not just uh, militarily, uh, they're running in Iraqi elections and they're fighting on behalf of the Islamic Republic in Syria as well. So Iran has developed a major infrastructure uh, using Iraq as a conduit to really exercise influence uh, throughout the region. Um, and the U.S. is still competing with Iran and Iraq. I don't, I don't think it would be simplistic to say that Iran completely dominates Iraq. And I think there are Iraqi forces who want to push back against Iranian influence. Mm -hmm. uh, even uh, the prime minister of Iraq, Abadi, has been uh, described as somebody uh, who wants to create a balance between Iran and the United States and Iraq and wants to push back uh, against Iranian influence. But uh, the Iranian regime's influence in Iraq is tremendous uh, right now. But I think, you know, going back to an earlier question, uh, I think it's a little cliche at times to say the U.S. needs uh, a strategy for the region. But I think, uh, given everything happening in Iran, there are opportunities uh, that the U.S. could really take advantage of uh, to create a comprehensive strategy uh, to counter the Iranian regime's influence in the Middle East. Uh, and. Uh, I think if President Trump um, could see that by withdrawing from Syria, that would undermine the whole strategy of countering Iran, then possibly that policy could be reconsidered. But I mean, the, the administration has that strategy, to at least they claim they do. H.R. Um, McMaster gave, gave at least one speech uh, laying it out. You know, they want to counter Iran's funding of terrorist groups around the region. They want a missile shield. That's part of, they want to pull out of the Iran deal, whether or not it has anything to do with, with missiles. That's part of it. Uh, so they laid out several points that are, of, that are policy points that are, you know, like with lots of things that the Trump government are different than what he tweets or says. Um, is that well, not enough? Is it not happening? Well, I, I don't think the U.S. is focused on what's happening inside of Iran um, because Iran, in some ways, uh, I would argue, is in a pre-revolutionary stage or pre-rebellion. Uh, you know, it's experiencing major unrest uh, every day. I don't know, really see the U.S. doing anything about it. Uh, so I think to counter the regime in the region, uh, the U.S. has to do things within Iran as well uh, in terms of its public broadcasting, uh, information operations, uh, renewed sanctions against the Revolutionary Guards, uh, interdicting um, Iranian weapons, supplies to the Houthis. And I know the U.S. has been doing some of those things, uh, but uh, as an outside observer, I don't see a very uh, tight focus on Iran. I, you know, I think... Well, to, uh, to turn it back to Iraq, though, yeah. it's like how, what the U.S. can do or, or isn't I doing. I think Iraq is a limited uh, opportunity for the U.S. Limited. I think Iran has made major inroads in Iraq, uh, but I think Syria is a very vulnerable spot for the Iranian regime. Um, and pulling U.S. forces out and abandoning the Kurds is just going to hand a victory to Iran. So, Ellie, uh, um, on minority groups, is this part of the same conversation with them of, of competing alliances and of which way to turn, to Washington or Tehran? Well, it's definitely an important uh, element of all of that. And uh, if I want to build on what Ali just said, I think what we didn't see in the last years uh, in terms of the U.S. engagement is consistency and long-term approach. And uh, <clears throat> And this is, uh, this is the edge that Iranians and other regional actors have been able to bring to the table. Uh, uh, and if, if there's something that needs to be introduced now within any U.S. upcoming U.S. strategy or plan or whatever, I think consistency and long term are important. And one, one important part of it is working uh, with the communities themselves, including the minority groups, uh, understanding how the Iranians built their model in Lebanon and other places would definitely take you to the importance of the work at the community level. Uh, the Iranians did not invade any country. They did not put significant military resources in Lebanon or other places. They just worked with communities, with opinion leaders, with the educational institutions, with the religious institutions. Uh, they boosted the informal economy sector. I mean, there are a lot of lessons to draw from how the Iranians built their model and to uh, embrace a similar approach that would help uh, counter this this expansion. 
uh, and I mean, that, that's, so that's an argument against freezing funds in Syria. I mean, that's the argument for everything that's non-defense, all the diplomacy, all argument. the AID money, I mean, um, all the soft power that you can get in there. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't comment on a specific decision, but right. I would like to say, as I said in the beginning, the civilian engagement is an important part of any strategy in the region. We'll let, we'll let the next panel make their case for that, <laughs> I think. Um, um, I mean, Mona, when, what do you, what, what, what's caught your eye the most with Iraq's future right now? Um, I mean, I wonder if Iraq really is potentially in a moment of, of uh, opportunity. I mean, having emerged from um, uh, the struggle with ISIS, um, I mean, one question is to what extent those who have lived under ISIS rule, Sunnis, uh, have been utterly and completely turned off from that ideology. The other, I think, is the point that's come up in the earlier panel, this incipient um, move toward coming together on issues, on governance-related questions, as opposed to by sector ethnicity. And so in some ways, again, I mean, it, you know, this is the Middle East, and it's Iraq, so we have to, you know, everything is, is a bit caveated. But Let's see what happens with the election and, and where it goes from there. But in, in, in some ways, yeah, in May, the parliamentary elections, in some ways, Iraq could really offer a very important um, example uh, to others in the, in the region that are, have struggled with extremism, have struggled with governance issues. I mean, there's a long way to go for Iraq. There are issues with corruption and governance and other issues sure. that came up in the in previous panel. But I think it's, let's keep an eye on it and, and see whether there are some, there are some positive bright spots uh, uh, that should be nurtured and that can actually ideally illuminate a path for, for others in the region as well. Mark, I want to ask about uh, Russia's interest, but remind the audience, so we'll go to questions uh, next if you have them, think of them, um, catch my eye. Um, anything's on the table for this panel. Uh, so give us, give us the short brief of Russia's interest in Iraq and what they're most looking at and want, how they want things to turn out. Well, I think Russia is doing pretty well uh, in Iraq. Uh, you know, everything that they feared they were going to lose uh, when the U.S. was intervening uh, in Iraq, uh, 15 years later, they've, they've gained it. They're selling arms. They've got lots of investments in the Iraqi petroleum sector. Uh, they, um, um, you know, they're, they're mediating or, or, or sort of navigating between the Erbil-Baghdad relationship. They're... Uh, uh, they're, they're doing fine, and you know, I think that um, uh, one of the things that, they, that, that is appealing, I think, to different Iraqi actors about Russia is that it's neither America nor Iran, uh, and that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an alternate source. Now, there, there's no actor in Iraq that relies more on Russia than anybody else, uh, but the nice thing about Russia for for the Iraqis is that um, Russia will work with literally everyone. And it's really quite interesting, you know, that they were against the U.S. intervention, the, you know, the, against you know, the, the downfall of a, of a regime. They opposed everything. But they sure get along quite well with the regime that the U.S. helped raise up. Uh, and that, that, I think, is, is it's, um, their, their, their policy toward Iraq is actually uh, more an example of their broader Middle Eastern uh, policy than is their policy in Syria. There, they obviously have a, they've chosen a side, they, they are, they're very engaged, but in, in Iraq as elsewhere, they, they don't want to completely choose sides in any given conflict, just as they don't between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between Israel and Iran, between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, between the various factions in Libya, between the various factions in Yemen, that they, they, they work with, with everyone who is willing to work with them. Uh, and I think that this is, you know, so, so they're, they're engaged in Iraq. And I think that as elsewhere in the Middle East, uh, you know, outside of Syria, you know, the, a lot of the impetus for Russian policy is essentially commercially driven. And in, to this extent, they, they've done very well. You know, um, people thought that, you know, or said that, you know, Russia really made a mistake with Rosneft, you know, right after the Kurdish referendum signing uh, an oil agreement uh, with, the, with the KRG, and that uh, three of the five 
areas in which the agreement was to take effect, the Baghdad government took back. <laughs> and the, obviously, the, the Kurds can't, uh, Rosneft can't act there. And yet, the Baghdad government, uh, in fact, is working with Rosneft in these areas as well. That everyone thought that, oh, this is, they were going to alienate Baghdad. But somehow, they've managed not to do so. So they've, they, they have managed to, to balance their relationships between Baghdad and Erbil remarkably successfully, I would say. All right, uh, I'll get some questions for the audience, and I'd be remiss if I didn't call on Doug Ollivant sitting nice and up front and conveniently for us. If anyone may have something to say about Iraq right now, I'm sure it's, it's you. Um, what are your thoughts of, of the state of Iraq right now? And I ask you to, I mean, you're a longtime veteran of this, of this country, of this problem, and we're at a, yet another moment of American you know, exasperation with being there and having to have a future, which is kind of what allows the president to, to say, hey, we're pulling out and get, get that big applause. Um, that's actually not the question I stood up to ask, but I'll okay. just, I, I have very little to add to what Mona said. You know, the signs are very encouraging. Let's see what happens in May. Um, but the, the, sign looks, so the signs look good. Okay. Um, but I also want to follow up on what Mona was talking about, about Turkey, because it strikes me as that's the piece of this problem we're not talking about enough. If we just look at this map you so kindly put behind us, you know, we have the Iranians, we're pretty clear about what our relationship is with them. Uh, we have the Saudis, this administration is clearly all in with them, so we're okay. The Egyptians have their own problem, they're kind of out of the mix right now. And that leaves the Turks, and we seem to have a historic um, low, low, historically bad relationship with the Turks right now. And it strikes me, again, just looking at this map, um, it's going to be hard for the United States to act effectively in this region if the only people we have to work with are the Saudis. The only major power we have to work with are the Saudis. Um, even if we believe everything that we hear about Erdogan, even if we take that the worst case, we still manage to work with other people who are given less savory. Um, how do we get our relationship with Turkey back on track so that we have another relatively friendly power in the region we can work with? Good question. Well, oh, be, you know, and, and I'd like to hear from others besides <laughs> you. You okay. made yourself pretty clear. I mean, go ahead, though. Please start. <laughs> I'm happy to actually kick that to anyone that wants to take it. I mean, I, very briefly, and I'm not an expert on Turkey, but I, I think it's very clear that uh, to steal the title of today's overarching panel, our relationship with Turkey is very much on fraught terrain. And I think we saw this coming, as I said before, because of the strategic decision that was taken in 2014 to rely on the Kurds. That set us up in many ways for where we are. Um, that doesn't mean it's unresolvable. And again, I, this is where I think diplomacy has a critical role to play. Uh, Turkey has some very legitimate concerns uh, with respect to uh, Kurdish uh, the Kurdish insurgency in its own country, uh, the role that the PKK plays, its concerns about terrorism. Um, but at the same time, I think it's essential that, as you note, I think we, this, the, 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 uh, our policy in Syria will not succeed if uh, Turkey remains so deeply at odds with us. The Turkish border with Syria is a long one. It's an essential partner in terms of some of this stabilization and humanitarian assistance that needs to flow its way into Syria. Um, for me, the question is really one for diplomats to sit down and to understand and lay out what are, what are the key concerns that Turkey has? How do we address those concerns in a way that um, doesn't completely sell the Kurds down the river, uh, but that also, again, yields some level of stability? My own sense is that the answer in part or maybe largely lies inside Turkey, which is to say that there is, I think, an important need to rejuvenate the Turkish-Kurdish uh, negotiations that had been going up until 2015. I think without resolving that, that big question, or at least putting it on more stable footing, it's very difficult to satisfy Turkish angst when it comes to what's happening inside Syria. I don't know. Gloria. But I don't know if uh, Turkey can satisfy U.S. angst. I don't, I don't think this is a one-sided issue. If you look at the Erdogan government, what it's doing in Turkey really matters. Uh, it is undermining secularism, has created an Islamist form of government. Uh, it is directly countering U.S. interests in the region. Uh, it's working with Russia and Iran. Uh, it was a conduit for Islamists to go into Syria uh, to fight 
uh, against the Assad regime, but that really con contributed to the violence in Syria as well. Um, and the uh, Erdogan government has consistently blamed the United States for its problems, the coup attempt, for example. And uh, that's not to say that the U.S. is not at fault, but when we look at Turkey, um, I wonder if um, it has changed to such an extent that its interests are no longer compatible with U.S. interests in the region. And I don't agree that uh, Saudi Arabia is the only country the U.S. is working with in the region. Uh, there are many countries that the U.S. is working with. Uh, but again, if there are uh, countries like Iran and Turkey that are actively countering U.S. interests, then the question is, uh, what kind of relationship will the U.S. have with them? We know what kind of relationship the U.S. has with the Islamic Republic. It's uh, animosity toward the United States is not going to go away anytime soon. I don't think Turkey has reached that point, uh, but it can potentially, and I think uh, the characteristic of Turkey's political system and the characteristic of Turkey's le leadership really does matter. Well, I mean, my thought as, as you were speaking, Mona, was that the idea of, of Turk Kurd renewal of talks might be one of those few places there could be a U.S. entry to Doug's question to helping you know, bridge or, or repair relations with Turkey, but at some point it's beyond American control. Uh, you know, everything that's going on in Turkey that is out of Erdogan is coming out of Erdogan, and that's, you know, that's not going to change unless he changes to some degree. Um, how much of this, I mean, let's check our hubris at the door for a minute. You know, we're all, here we are in Washington talking about what the United States can do for this gigantic region and what we can't do. Uh, you know, what, how, that's my question is how, how much can this administration can right now do um, when I've heard from lots of, you know, former staffers of DOD and NSC and state who say, look, once you get into the office, into these jobs, and you've been in AID, but, uh, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful, you have a lot of ideas that you think you're going to change the world, and then you get there and you spend 80% 80, 80 of your time reacting to the news of the day and the fire hose coming at you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, how much is the United States, in a way, stuck at the devices of all these other countries we're talking about and the politics going on, and how much can the United States really do? at this point, with this team, with, at this moment. Yeah. I, I would just wanted to say that, you know, to the extent that Trump's announcement of withdrawing from Syria doesn't just have a U.S. domestic politics logic, but an actual foreign policy one, that, that the aim of it might, in fact, be to reduce Turkish-American tensions. In other words, that if the U.S. is gone, I think probably the one government that's especially happy is Erdogan. And then one of two things will happen. If the Turks move in to Syria and defeat the Kurds, then suddenly there's a big Turkish presence in Syria, and this puts it at odds with both Iran and Russia. That's not such a bad thing. Or Turkey doesn't defeat the Kurds. Turkey gets involved in something longer uh, than it had bargained for, and then suddenly it's going to need the United States for mediation, perhaps between uh, itself and the Syrian Kurds. I don't know if that's the logic, but what it, what it seems to me is that is that, you know, it, it makes sense in you know looking at Trump's policy toward Europe. The Europeans should pay more for their defense, not us. Similarly, with with I think Syria, people are concerned about Iran. Why should the U.S. be the one to undertake the heavy lifting? Let those in the neighborhood do so. And it seems that this that that if the announcement has any kind of foreign policy logic. It seems to me that this is what it relates to. Yeah, well, that's, those are almost the president's words exactly, was, you know, let them deal with it. Mm -hmm. And again, that's, you know, that's what he ran on and got to the White House thought. I have a question from this gentleman right in the middle was first up. Uh, Peter Humphrey, intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, Turkey could have solved this problem five years ago. It has one of the best militaries in the world. They did nothing. We're stuck with uh, going for another ally or two. Uh, and that's how we wind up where we are today. So I haven't got a lot of sympathy for Turkey here. Uh, Turkey views YPG and PKK as one and the, one and the same. Uh, the US views them more nuanced, even though they both put up posters of Ojalan. Um, is it possible that uh, uh, a cordon sanitaire of one kilometer along the border might alleviate some of uh, Turkey's concerns? Um, and what happens when American airplanes dropping American bombs using American satellite imagery actually kill a couple of special forces soldiers? Uh, what does the Trump administration do in that ultimate nightmare? 
so you're asking about the prospects of a safe zone on the ground and if you, and U.S. friendly fire casualties. Okay, who wants to take one of those? I'll, I'll touch on the, the safe zone yeah. question. I mean, that, that frankly already exists and to some extent. I mean, Euphrates Shield, uh, which is a, a pocket uh, in Syria that is uh, bordering on Turkey that the, the Turks essentially have, not, have taken control over since, I think, spring of uh, last year, um, is essentially playing that role, as is potentially now this Afrin Canton. Um, but uh, first of all, and I'm not a military strategist, but a one kilometer uh, buffer zone it, it was not going to do it, would not be significant enough. And I think we do have to bear in mind, again, the other, these Kurdish held areas uh, to the east of Euphrates Shield, uh, which the Kurds, uh, which are Kurdish majority, and uh, you know, the Kurds aren't going to simply melt away. And so my fear is that without diplomacy, and if the U.S. should withdraw, I worry not that Turkey will take over, but you've basically opened up a whole nother front and a whole nother conflict in a Syria that's already laden with conflicts. And this one would be a Turkish Kurdish with all kinds of other uh, proxies and actors getting involved as well. So I don't think the answer is buffer zones or safe zones beyond what Turkey has already established. Again, I think the answer is really more in trying to understand uh, where that common space is. There, there, there must be some sort of diplomatic solution that begins to address Turkey's concerns with respect to Kurdish terrorism, as they call it, and that also allows and addresses the need for stability inside Syria. Does anyone want to comment on friendly fire? I don't know if this is the right panel for that. I'll just, as a defense report, I think the, the bigger concern is, would be more on ground action, that the air campaign, the bombing campaign has really has significantly slowed just because there's not, there are fewer targets. And the concern was that if there are going to be more and more intense uh, ground engagements with the remaining ISIS elements in the MIRV, for example, that those would be hotter possible you know, in, individual battles that would involve still U.S. special operators of any stripe. Um, which could re result with more casualties. And as we mentioned at the top, we've already had a casualty over the weekend uh, of an ID. Uh, so, you know, there will be more casualties one way or another. Uh, the next question we had up, up here, this woman. Uh, thank you. Hi, Amy Austin Holmes from the Woodrow Wilson Center. We had a panel actually yesterday on Syria where we were talking about some of these issues. And I agree that it is a very pivotal and, and dangerous moment. Um, I would, however, like to point out that during the first decade of AKP rule, there was actually, you know, Turkey had established under Foreign Minister Ahmed Davad Ulu, the former Foreign Minister, trade relations with Syria. Um, Turkey also had quite good relations with the Kurdistan regional government of Iraq. I, actually, of the four different countries where we have Kurdish minorities, the country with which Turkey arguably, arguably had the best relations was the KRG of Iraq. Um, so the country which was also closest to you know, had, had the greatest amount of autonomy, was, had a regional government, etc. So I think it's not inconceivable that Turkey would accept the fact that in northern Syria there is a predominantly Kurdish population and to establish, you know, to, to sort of find a way to live in peace with them. I mean, through trade relations, through diplomacy, because, and th these aren't necessarily ideas from Washington, from the United States, but the, this happened within the AKP. I mean, as, as Mona has rightly pointed out, it was under Erdogan's leadership that there was a ceasefire negotiated between the Turkish government and the PKK between 2013 and 2015. And I think, you know, we need to find a way for Turkey to solve this problem internally within, uh, within Turkey, um, and then, you know, resolve the, the conflict with, uh, you know, within northern Syria. Um, I, I would be curious to hear your thoughts as to how we could do this, but again, this could be done with the AKP, with Erdogan, because if we look at their previous policies, um, you know, they had established trade relations, they had good diplomatic relations with both, uh, with both Iraq and Syria. So the, an open question, I guess, on how to get to uh, that point of, of negotiating with Turkey about especially through Kurdistan. I mean, I, I think your, your, your suggestion makes perfect sense. I would view that as an aspirational goal well down the road, but I, I, I concur with that notion that if it, you know, there, it's not inconceivable. 
Um, for me, I think the most important starting point is to, again, figure out a way to at least rejuvenate talks, at least start talking again. And again, as I said previously, I think that front and center on this whole Kurdish-Turkish tension question is moving forward with resolving the issue of insurgency inside Turkey uh, and, again, rejuvenating discussions and, and peace talks as a way of, of beginning to de-escalate that situation. Without that, uh, it's virtually impossible to imagine, given the proximity along Turkey's border, um, how you could find some sort of uh, common ground with respect to, to Syrian Kurds in Turkey. We're being, we're being told it's your time to wrap. And again, at 12.30, there's a, another event for a lot of our panelists here. And the audience, I'm reminded to, to tell you, is welcome to lunch as well. Um, but be back here in your seats by 1.30 promptly for the start of the big final panel. Uh, so your final thoughts on Iraq. And I'll, I'll, I'll put a generic statement out there, but feel free to take it where you like. Uh, once, and, it, and it's simply convince the American people why this, the U.S. needs to continue there. And I think it's a, it's a simple question we often take for granted in our fields, but one that I hear constantly and one of the kind of feedback we get from our readers. Uh, which, there's just so many people, and that's what the president's playing to again when he says the things that he said last week, uh, who think enough is enough. Uh, this is not the United States problem, and look at the rest of the region. Can Iraq isolate itself from these other problems and have, a, you know, is it, a, is it different? Is it a new time around? Should there be hope? Can I? Please. Uh, I mean, two main reasons, uh, very quickly. The first one is that Iraq is still a workable case. Uh, is it, it's doable. And the second one is that what's happening in Iraq and Syria and the region uh, is going to hit the U.S. interest at some point, uh, whether the U.S. interest in the region or, or the U.S. national security here back home. So for these two reasons, I think it's very important for the U.S. to play a role in stabilizing the region and finding this peace and security framework that I mentioned before. Ali, quickly. The same reasons. Withdrawing from the Middle East is not an option right now uh, or for the foreseeable future. Uh, if the U.S. withdraws from Iraq and Syria, it will just make pro the problems worse. Uh, the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia is going to heat up. Uh, there might be a military conflict between Iran and Israel. Uh, if there's conflict in the Persian Gulf, uh, oil prices uh, could be affected. The U.S. economy could be negatively affected. There are many, many reasons as to why the U.S. should uh, stay in these countries uh, for now anyways. And I'm not very optimistic about the Iraqi elections in May. I think the Iranian regime will try very hard uh, to shape them. And given its uh, past successes, I would not be surprised if it's successful in manipulating Iraqi elections now as well. And that's really one major reason the U.S. should maintain uh, the influence it has, it has in Iraq today. Mark? Yeah, I, I would concur. I think that uh, although America's continued involvement in the Middle East is not going to solve the region's problems, we, we know that. But withdrawal could lead to them becoming far, far worse and much more difficult to manage. And in that, you know, the Middle East is the home of, uh, you know, so many of the world's population, so many Muslims, uh, that uh, our, our relationship with the entire Muslim world, I think, is, is something that we, we need to be careful about just uh, uh, abandoning, that it's not going to, to be better for the United States if that happens. So, so that as painful as it is, that the costs of continued involvement, I think, uh, are far less than the costs of, of, of withdrawal and, and, and what, what could result uh, afterward. No. I would not have much more to add to what's already been said, only though to say I think it's incumbent on all of us, us on the stage and, and many in the room, I mean, we must acknowledge that, that many Americans really don't fully understand or see fully the value of, of these kinds of engagements, particularly, I think, the soft power elements of what the U.S. can do. And so I think it's incumbent to, to do more outreach and to, in other words, it's, it's, a, it's not only what we do in the region, but it's also how it's understood here in America and that it is really important to play that informing role. More outreach to the American public. Uh, well, I, I fully support that as a, as a journalist <laughs> who runs a media organization. And I, I look forward to our, the next panel after lunch. Uh, which, uh, as I told the organizers, I'm thrilled those, those people have agreed to come on stage uh, on the record and on camera 
uh, to tell us exactly what they're doing because that's this is their this is their job. Uh, thank you to our panel. Thank you to all of you for joining us and making the discussion richer. Uh, we'll see you after the next lunch.